growing up, um, I was exposed to technology throughout. And I remember particularly, uh, my parents were entrepreneurs, and my mom specifically was an accountant. And that naturally meant that I interacted with numbers quite a bit. Um, I remember um, in 1997, uh, my dad came home with a desktop PC. Um, and I was so excited. Um, and I remember there were only three applications you could care about. Um, you had Solitaire, you had uh, WordPerfect, and you had Paint. Uh, do you, any of you guys remember those things? Um, Solitaire, I didn't get. I still don't get uh, Solitaire. <laughs> Um, but I remember playing around with paint so much and for hours on end. And, you know, my dad's room was locked all the time. Don't ask how I got in. Luckily, my folks are not here today. Um, and then later on, you know, I went to high school. And when I went to high school, I was so excited by the idea of technology. What this did is that it informed my journey, the journey that I'm still on today, um, of how technology can help people to evolve, um, of how technology can help people solve problems. Um, and you know, interestingly, if I look at some of the innovations that have come through technology in the past, say, 10 years in Kenya and in Africa as a whole, um, we're way on that journey. In 2007, um, Nick Hughes and a couple of the guys from Vodafone were thinking of a way of how to bridge the gap of how smallholder farmers across Africa could pay their microloans. And one of the things that they thought through is, what if we were to pilot um, in Kenya? Um, and Safaricom was a pilot. Um, and they said, listen, what if we try this thing out in Thika and see how well this would do? Well, it did really well. And one of the things that they saw was, yes, people were paying back their loans on time, and that was great. Uh, but the biggest thing was what people were using it for mainly, which was sending and receiving money. And hence, uh, M-Pesa was born. Now, why this story is relevant is because in 2007, 2008, you know, there were only at about a million um, active users on the, on, the, on the platform. Well, now they're at 11.8 million uh, active users on the system. That's people who have used the system in the last 30 days. They're now moving 6 billion uh, Kenya shillings uh, every day. Every day. And now that's, if you want to take that down into numbers that you can crunch on, um, that's 4 million shillings a minute. Right? And that's uh, 70,000 Kenya shillings every second. See that? See that? See that? That's 210,000 right there. <laughs> right? Um, but then beyond that, it's what's interesting that comes out of that. 10% of the cash being moved up and down this ecosystem is being used in bulk payments. And when we're thinking about um, what we could do as virtual city, these are some of the facts that we took into place as well. Um, Mshuari, a, a service launched in 2012, started off with a handful of users, 80,000 users, who are mainly borrowing between 1,000 and 2,000 shillings on average. Um, they have now moved to, you know, right about 900,000 uh, loan accounts. And just to put that into perspective, Equity Bank, which has been there for the longest, has only 810. So at the beginning of this year, M. Shwari actually pipped Equity Bank as the largest um, uh, loan provider, if you may say. Um, internet usage in this country is at a remarkable level. Um, only four out of 10 people in this country don't have access to the internet. 60% of the people in this country have an internet connection. Now that has amazing implications for uh, people who see opportunities or, or people looking at uh, business opportunities as well. Now, in 2007, sorry, in 2011, uh, as, it, as it may have it, I joined a technology company, uh, Virtual City. And at the time when I was joining, Virtual City had just won a million dollars uh, in a Nokia competition uh, for being, you know, for producing an application that could be used in emerging markets. Um, and they won a million dollars. And you know, when I was joining, you know what I generally thought? I thought I could get a share of the million dollars. This is me. Um, but then Virtual City, uh, still led by the visionary John Waiboshi, who, who's a great friend, uh, a great mentor, but possibly one of the greatest um, innovators of our time, um, was thinking of a way of taking all these advances that were taking place in technology and M-Pesa and M-Shwari at the time that were yet to be born, and how do we help smallholder farmers? Because at the time, 
you know, we had been exposed a lot to farming growing up, um, and him as well, and he could see the struggles that smallholder farmers were going through. And the idea was, how do you take advantage of all this technology to help these farmers? And what we did is, we then went into the field. And I'd like to introduce you to uh, Anne Modoni, a farmer in, in Embu, who we met. And what we met when we went out there is we found uh, a manual waste scale. Uh, she's a coffee farmer uh, out in Embu. And the waste scale was so huge and so inaccurate um, that she would lose value every day she took her crop. Um, and the next thing we saw was the manual records, right? So they had these buying clerks um, who would write down on a piece of paper how much you had brought every day. And then they'd put that against your name, and then at the end of the month or at the end of the harvest season, they would tabulate everything and then say how much you, you, you're owed. But the problem with that was the buying clerks were part of the problem. Because you see, the buying clerks would write what they felt they should write. So instead, for instance, if you had a bag of um, 30 kilograms, they would write 20 kilograms. And they'd create a ghost farmer who had 10 kilograms. So in fact, it's an adage in a lot of rural areas in Kenya where you find that the buying clerks are the richest farmers in that village, yet they don't have a single acre of, of anything. And, and this was a problem that really hurt us because my grandmother as well and my grandfather are farmers as well. So I felt the pain of Anne um, and her struggle because I'd seen it as well. And then what we then saw very initially in our studies as we were just, you know, just trying to create the product was farmers were losing 20 shillings for every 100 shillings they earned. Now, it doesn't seem like much. You know, it's only 20%. But then take that for a million farmers. And in something like coffee where you have two, three harvest seasons, you're looking at quite a number. But then look at dairy where you're then looking at three harvest seasons a day. You know, they, they, they do deliveries at 3 a.m., maybe another round at 10 a.m., and another one in the evening for 365 days a year. It's a lot of money, right? What we then decided is, what if we could create a technology based on everything we have seen in the field? What if we could create a mobile-based technology that would sit on a mobile device that would have offline capability? Because we're in a country where as long as you're in a mountainous region, you're not assured of, or in a hilly area, you're not assured of uh, connectivity. But would then allow um, farmers to be able to bring their crop, put it on a digital scale so that it's accurate and it's tamper-proof and it would go to a mobile device by a Bluetooth and then a printout would come out. But then the technology had to be scalable. So we had to take this, we had to design it in such a way that we could use it in Kenya, but then we could take it to Rwanda as well or we could take it to the Gambia, or we could take it anywhere, basically, and it would work. And it would have a, an SMS component that would allow farmers to communicate with each other, but also communicate with the cooperatives and the input suppliers. And, and when we were dreaming this up, it sounded really nice. You know, it was, it was you know, something we did on a whiteboard, and it was, oh, this is very sexy. We, I hope one day we can do this. And when we started, um, one of the first things that we're able to do is we looked at the supply chain and we said, who are the actors in the supply chain? So at the lowest level, you have the farmers. Above them, you have something called a buying center. Now, a buying center is the equivalent of parliament in the rural areas. It is where everything happens. You know, this is where the crop is brought. This is where payments are made. This is where fertilizer is gotten from. So it's a very political place to be. So we started there. And we said, what kind of technology do we need to install there that is localized? And we said, what if we started with a mobile device? So we gave the buying clerk a mobile device. Above him, we had the cooperative or the cooling plant where everything was aggregated. And we said, listen, let's put a, a simple PC there as well and aggregate all this information. And let's take advantage of the GSM networks and let's, let's push the information up. And then above that, you then had the processor. And the processor could be um, uh, a, a, a miller, or it could be uh, a manufacturer of any sort, who is then aggregating all the produce from all the different cooperatives and, and creating finished goods. And after we mapped the entire supply chain, we then got to work. We created this product called AgriManager. Uh, now, we started off uh, with a couple of pilots, 
um, in the North Rift, um, in Embu, with, with Anne and, and, and the rest of the farmers there. And when we started, this is what we did. We, we got a digital scale, uh, like the one on your screens. Um, and what that did, two things. One, we put a screen so big that all the farmers could see. See, what the buying clerks would take advantage of is because the manual weigh skills were so sort of vague. You know, they could say, this looks like 10 kilos, or it looks like 9, or it looks like 8. But the screen was so big on the digital scale, the farmer at the last end of the line could say, oh, he got 15 kilos. So one, we got it to be a shared platform in that sense. The next thing we did is we said, we're going to standardize the cans or the bags. Because one of the ways that the buying clerks were defrauding the farmers is they would say, um, you know, this can that we're going to put your milk into is, um, weighs 10 kilos. So we're going to deduct 10 kilos from your milk. And because the farmers had no way of verifying, you know, they'd take their word for it. Again, more ghost farmers, right? So we were creating more ghost farmers than we create actual produce. And the next thing we then did is we installed, we had a mobile device for every uh, buying clerk. Now, all these three devices were tamper-proof um, and could communicate wirelessly via Bluetooth by themselves. So literally, uh, the buying clerk um, was not the most excited guy, as you'd imagine, because um, he could not tamper with the system. Uh, the systems had automatic um, sort of switching off capability, so if you tried to mess up with it, it would you know, automatically switch itself off, it switch itself off and would notify us uh, back in Nairobi that something was happening. Um, the next thing we did is we installed a mobile printer later, and, and this printout became the holy grail of what every farmer carries up to today. You know, now we had 300,000 farmers, and you go out to any of the, the farmers, uh, farmer cooperatives that we're working with, and they'll tell you that printout is a payslip. Because between me and you, if you want to get a loan today and you're employed, you can walk to any bank, and they're going to give you a loan just based on your payslip. Now, farmers don't have that. They have this receipt. That receipt allows them to go in, um, get a loan, um, and use that as collateral. So what did we see? One of the greatest things that we saw was, you know, the impact numbers were amazing in terms of what we were able to achieve for the farmers income-wise and everything. But what strikes me from the entire pilot we did was, um, in a town in Kisi, when we started off, um, there was a farmer cooperative that was fighting us. In a sense, the, the buying clerks had a lot of power, and they didn't like the idea of killing their ghost farmers, because one of the first things that the system did, in, immediately you installed it, all the ghost farmers were dead, because there was a verification process. Uh, so one day, they messed around with the systems, they switched them off, and when they were at the buying center, when the farmers came around to bring their crop, uh, the buying clerk said, you know, you know what, the systems are not working today. Um, these Nairobi guys, they really don't understand how we work. You know, let's kill this system. Let's not work with this thing. It's, it's horrible. You know, let's, let's kill it. Um, and the farmers were like, what, what do you mean? You know, that the system, we've seen the benefits so far. We, we want the system back. And the buying clerk said, no, no, uh, these Nairobi guys, the system doesn't work. It's, it's, it's offline. And you know what the farmers did? The farmers took their crop, poured it on the ground, and burnt it. And what this message, what the message here was, is, you know, don't mess with us. We want the system back because we know how much you've been stealing from us now. Because in the first six to 12 months of using the system, we saw a jump of 50% uh, income-wise, right? there was a 19% jump in production. Like, all of a sudden, we're not even innovators. We are creators. We are creating more produce. And Virtual City are the creators of produce, like, like it was. But it's not that we're producing more produce, or we're not creating new produce. We're just tracking everything better. We could tell what was in the supply chain at every point, at every second. We could tell how much was laden in the truck. We could tell which truck was carrying what at what point. We could tell what the grid was all the way from the buying center all the way to the processor. Now, what's next for us? We're now looking at going to more commodities. We are now looking at coffee um, more intensely. We're now looking at tea. We're looking at dairy. 
we're now looking at horticulture as well. An interesting story about horticulture. About um, six months ago, um, the Euro, the EU banned horticulture exports from certain companies from, from Kenya. Now, the main reason for that, there were many reasons, but the main reason was um, uh, residue levels were too high. Basically, the chemicals we were using and the pesticides we were using for biocontrol were not in control, or there were, no, there were in amounts that were um, not allowed. Now, what that did is 99 companies were banned, and for us, we were just at the cusp of creating this new traceability technology that's now going to be integrated into AgriManager. And what that will allow these 99 guys who are banned is it will create a track record of the produce all the way from the farm to the processor, all the way to export, right? The other thing that we're seeing that's very interesting um, is farmer, banks are now interested in how do we get in financial inclusion for these farmers? How do we give them loans yet? I don't even know them. The receipt is fine, but I also want to know what the last nine months were. How is his performance? What does he bring every day? Now, banks are coming to us and saying, give us this farmer's profile over the last year or two, and we'll give him four or five times that in inventory. We'll give him inputs. We'll, give, we'll pay school fees for him. We'll pay his medical bills. Now, what we've realized is we're creating now an ecosystem an ecosystem where you have different players like the farmers, you have input providers, you have banks, you have microfinance, you have buyers, you have sellers. It's an ecosystem. Now, this was not there before, and there are a lot of people trying to do it as well. We are now looking at Rwanda and Ethiopia very seriously because they're, they're going through some of the same problems that we saw three, four years ago. And they're very interested in what we're doing because we can help their farmers and we can empower them. And our target really is, in five years, we want to be creating about $300 million worth of value that will be going straight back into the pocket of the farmer. And that's right about the 2% the of the GDP of Uganda, you know, just to put it in perspective. But what, what can we take away to conclude? I would say, um, let's modernize. Let's not westernize. And let's not take farmers as people who don't understand what's going on. Farmers are actually quite intelligent people. And because of the advances they're starting to see, because of Facebook, because of M-Pesa, because of Virtual City, they're already well trained. They already know how to use these devices. Now it's up to us and some of the innovators sitting in this room to create even better solutions, newer solutions that will allow them to bridge the gap between things like financial inclusion and literacy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.